Hello guys, my name is Max and welcome to this third video where we will understand the numbers we got from the previous video. At this point we have stress and strain values for each one of the plastics, but now we need to actually make sense of our analysis. So what we're going to do next is we're going to graph the three plastics together and that'll let us compare the relative properties of each plastic. So let's start off with the blue plastic since it's the first one here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to copy paste the stress strain values here and then this is going to let us graph all of them onto this one uh, plot. So to start off let's do equals sign and then let's go to the blue plastic tab and click on the strain, press enter, and then do the same thing for the stress of the blue plastic. So equals and then stress. And now that we have these two, we just drag down until we don't have any more values left. All right, so here we run into a bunch of zeros. Once we get to this point, then you can select these cells and just delete their values. Now, if we scroll back up, we'll see that red is the next, uh, the next plastic, the red control. So for this one, we're going to go to the following empty uh, row and then do the same thing, except for the red plastic. So equals, go to the red plastic tab and then equals strain, enter, then do the same for the stress and drag down until we don't have any more values. And lastly, delete the zeros. And then we have the yellow left. So let's just do equals, go to the yellow tab and then do equals strain and then same for the stress of the yellow plastic and just drag down until you have no more data left delete the zeros and we are done so now that we're here if we scroll back up we'll see that the graph is now populated with the data and we can actually see relative differences in the three curves. Now, before we make sense of this, uh, of these curves, I first want to explain the anatomy, if you will, of the uh, stress strain curve of a material. So if we go here to this graph, this is kind of like an ideal illustration of what a, a curve should look like, assuming no noise and ideal properties. So we have strain and stress as our axes. You'll see here in the first little bit of the graph, we have the elastic region. This is essentially um, the, the area where the material acts very elastically, meaning that the strain and the stress are proportional to each other. Eventually, the elastic region comes to an end. This is known as the yield point and uh, is denoted by the yield strength. After this point, the behavior is no longer a straight line. If you were to graph it, it starts to curve down a little bit and eventually it will fracture. Now, after the elastic region, we have plastic deformation. This means that any deformation here is now permanent and it will no longer return to its perfect uh, original state. If you were to release the tension here, it would follow the same slope, but it would not return to zero. It would return or it would not return to the origin. It would return a little bit right of the origin. The point where it fractures is also known as the ultimate tensile strength. The ultimate tensile strength is essentially the highest amount of tensile uh, stress it could handle 
uh, anywhere on the graph. This doesn't necessarily have to be at the fracture point, as I'll show you in the next graph. In this plot, this is more characteristic of a ductile metal. You'll see here to the left of the yield point, denoted by the yield strength as well, um, you have the elastic region. This is essentially where the, once again, the characteristics are directly proportional to one another, so you get a straight line. And then to the right of this, you have a nonlinear region, which is where plastic deformation occurs. Now here you're, you'll also see that the fracture point and the ultimate tensile strength are not uh, on top of each other. Instead, what happens is that the ultimate tensile strength happens before fracture. And what's going on between these two points is called necking. So the material is getting thinner and that in turn weakens it. So as it starts to get weaker, um, it can handle less stress and eventually it will break and fracture. Now the material after yielding uh, will start to experience strain hardening, which is why this line continues to increase all the way until it reaches its ultimate tensile strength. Keep in mind that this is characteristic for ductile metals, such as uh, steels, uh, low carbon steels. However, our plastics exhibit behaviors more similar to the first graph, which is this one. Now, a little recap of what strain is. Strain is the elongation over the original length. So this is um, a unitless parameter, and that's because we're going to have a length scale on the numerator divided by a length scale on the denominator. So for example, if we're using meters for both of these, it would be meter over meter, so they cancel out. The elongation measures the difference in length from the original, whereas the original length simply measures the length of the specimen at time equals zero. In other words, time equals zero just means at the beginning of the experiment. Stress is defined by the force divided by the cross-sectional area. In the experiment, what we're doing is we are attaching the top of the specimen to a rod, and then we put the Newton scale on the bottom and we start to pull on it. Now these two forces are going to be equal to each other. And this is what the F represents. It's just the force represented by one of these arrows. What the cross-sectional area refers to is if you were to cut the specimen uh, perpendicular to the direction of the arrow, then you would get a surface. And the cross-sectional area is just measuring the area of that surface. All right, so looking back at the graph that we just produced, we will see that the three plastics have very different characteristics. If we start off with the yellow high gelatin bioplastic, we'll see that it doesn't exhibit much strain. Now recall that strain is elongation divided by original length. So this bioplastic didn't stretch much. However, this was the one that could handle the highest amount of stress, or in other words, the highest amount of force per cross-sectional area. Moving on to the control, this one we see stretched a little bit more. It had a bit more strain, but that came at the cost of a lower stress. And finally, if we move on to the high glycerol blue bioplastic, we'll see that that one handled the highest amount of strain but the lowest stress. These properties are important to understand, um, not just because it directly tells you which ones are the strongest and which ones are the stretchiest, uh, but also because these bioplastics um, have different impact resistance. Impact resistance is the measure of energy that a material can absorb upon impact. So when we talk about impact resistance, we're talking about the area under the graph. And here, if we kind of imagine 
the area under the yellow line. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell because it's pretty squiggly, but it's not very, it's not a lot of area. So that tells us that it doesn't have a very good uh, impact resistance if you were to hit it with a hammer, for example. Whereas the red one has quite a bit more area under the curve. So if you were to hit the, the red bioplastic, it would probably be able to dissipate much more energy than the yellow one. If we look at the blue one, um, we'll see that it also has quite a bit of area under the curve, more than the yellow one. Um, but I can't tell without further analysis if it's more than the red one. But either way, uh, with the with the blue high glycerol bioplastic and the red control, we can tell that these two bioplastics have a higher impact resistance than the yellow high gelatin bioplastic. Now let's just pretend that we're going to try to make a building out of these three materials. And the question is, which one would you prefer uh, to construct that building out of? Uh, well, right away we can tell that the blue one is pretty stretchy and it cannot handle that much stress, which means that it cannot handle much loading. So therefore the stretchy blue bioplastic is out. Then we have these two remaining bioplastics, the control and the high gelatin. And you might be tempted to go straight for the high gelatin because it has a higher stress, which is true, and it will be able to handle a higher load. However, the disadvantage to a high gelatin construction is that it doesn't deform much. And the reason why I call this a disadvantage is because it doesn't give you much of a warning that it's going to fail. If you were to go with the red control bioplastic, this one would give you a bit more of a warning that it's about to fail or that you're pushing it too far. Because as you start to increase the stress, the strain or the deformation starts to increase. This means that you'll see the material deform as you load it too much. Whereas the high gelatin, it will pretty much stay in the same shape until it's too late and it just collapses on you without much of a warning. Another advantage of the control red bioplastic compared to the yellow one is that the added strain might actually allow the building to move a little bit, which lets it move a little bit of the loading to another area that doesn't have as much stress. So in this scenario, we have an individual standing on a platform that is suspended by four ropes. Now, suppose that these ropes are made out of the more flexible control plastic. Uh, that means that they'll be able to stretch and they will stretch as more force is applied to them. So for example, if this individual were to walk towards one of the corners, then this rope highlighted in red now has more stress and therefore more strain if you go back to that graph. Um, the advantage to that is that by having this corner move down, some of the loading is actually moved to these other two uh, to these other two ropes. Now the curve can also work in the other direction and you can actually calculate the theoretical strain that you would see at these two points and calculate the corresponding stress. Now what will happen is that you will get an equilibrium from the ropes in the scenario, um, which is a pretty common engineering question if you go into mechanical engineering. And that is basically just if if a certain structural element is having some sort of deformation, how do the remaining structural elements react to that? Now, the disadvantage to the more rigid uh, high gelatin bioplastic is that going back to the scenario where is, if this person goes to the corner, um, this rope isn't going to be able to deform much, 
which means that the loading distribution is going to be more concentrated on this one rope. The other ropes aren't going to be able to contribute or to help out. All right, that just about sums up the material analysis of these bioplastics. Hope you enjoyed and thanks for watching.